friends want to talk more about the mind and the world creating process of our own mind because again this you know, theme of this retreat is awareness of living and dying and living is primarily in your mind uh, I mean the real essential life and also dying is in the mind not so much the physical body the body is just a vehicle but the actual workings and the mechanisms of life and, and death are within our own mind now <clears throat> you know the science these days they're uh, interested in trying to find out what is the what is the beginning of the earth you know what's the physical age of this earth, right? Or the universe. How many people have heard that? And so they've been sending up missiles or, you know, to blow up comets and meteors in order to get some rocks, you know, to bring back to earth and find out how old the earth is. Is it 5 billion years old, 15 billion years old? You know, as if it were important somehow. I don't know. But the Buddha wasn't interested in the age of the earth or where this world came from, this physical earth. And uh, but he was interested in how does the mind create the world. We're not saying that this earth doesn't exist. Or he wasn't saying that, but the way we perceive it and uh, uh, live in it is, is created within our mind for the most part. Now, there's an interesting little start. There was once a, a deva. A deva is a kind of a celestial being, like, sort of like an angel, you might say, <laughs> to use equivalent uh, Christian terminology. Uh, and these devas are said to be in one stride like that, they could cover a hundred miles. So one morning this deva got up and he said, I want to find the end of the world. And so he started walking here and there and he, he went to ask some uh, of the, uh, you know, knowledgeable ascetics, you know, the self-professed enlightened ascetics of the day. So he went to one and he said, Sir, tell me how to find the end of the world. He kind of scratched his head and uh, So he went to another guy. And they asked him the same question. He scratched his head again and said, go uh, ask another guy. So like that, he went to several different uh, people. And then finally, the last one, he said, tell me how to find the end of the world. And he said, go ask Maha Brahma. Maha Brahma was the creator god within the Hindu uh, mythology, right? It's supposed to have created the, uh, the world. He said, go ask Maha Brahma. He created it. He should be there to tell you how to get to the end of it. She said, oh, that's a great idea. So he kind of ran up to the Brahma Loka, and uh, Maha Brahma was. Uh, sitting in a, 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 in a congregation with all these sort of lesser Brahmas, <laughs> lesser gods, you know, giving them some talk. And so this uh, Deva goes up to the Brahma 
and taps him on the shoulder and says, oh, sir, sir, please tell me how to reach the end of the world. And he said, shh, don't speak so loudly. I don't want my disciples to hear. I don't know. Go ask the Buddha. <laughs> so he's, he's telling us, I said, you go back to the earth and ask the Buddha. He just left. <laughs> uh, so when he, he goes back, comes to the Buddha and relays all what had happened. And then the Buddha kind of chuckled under his breath and my dear Rohitisa, that was the Deva's name, my dear Rohitisa, you're not going to find the end of the world by physically running. And that's when he, the Buddha made his most profound uh, utterance. He said that the world, the origin of the world, and the ceasing of the world is right here within this five or six, six foot long body with its nervous system, memory, and consciousness. And <clears throat> so uh, that's that's the world to the Buddha, basically. Uh, and and the world to the Buddha is the world of impermanence. But anyway, so uh, what I wanted to you know uh, talk about this afternoon was the uh, the, the links of dependent origination. So the cornerstone doctrine of the, the Buddha, which I had mentioned uh, briefly the other day, uh, explains the, the second noble truth and the third noble truth. Now, how many people have heard the four noble truths? Some matter? Okay. So... <clears throat> You know, the first noble truth is that suffering exists. And then the second one is, how does this suffering, how did it arise? And how does it continue? And the third noble truth is that this suffering, uh, even though it didn't have an origination, as I had mentioned yesterday, the Buddha couldn't find a first point in time when, when uh, birth and death uh, started. But it has an end. So the third noble truth is the end of suffering. And then the fourth noble truth is the path leading to the end of suffering. That means the way that we think, live, and meditate uh, to reach uh, the end of suffering or to bring suffering to an end you know, within our mind and even to the, the, the body to a large extent. So anyway, uh, story details, I'm not going to go into all of it. I think, uh, how many people have actually read it? The dependent origination. It's in this book. Uh, so basically it states, depending on ignorance, and ignorance means not knowing the truth. Ignorance means not knowing the four noble truths. It means not knowing all the various kinds of suffering and the nature of suffering, not knowing the cause and how it continues, and not knowing how it ceases, and not knowing how to bring suffering to an end. Because most people are just continuing to create more and more suffering all the time, right? Look at all these wars and fighting and crime and that's going on now all over the world. And they keep on generating over and over. And this has been happening for thousands of years. Not anything new. It's just that it's got more deadly, you know, with technology and nuclear bombs and so, so anyway, uh, you know, depending on ignorance, not knowing the truth. And on that diagram, how many looked at that diagram on the wall yesterday? That, uh, that artwork. So ignorance is depicted by a, a blind man walking, kind of like, in, you know, not being able to see the way and the bumping and things. Um, 
Anyway, depending on ignorance arises the volitional formations. And the volitional formations, it's a very complicated word to uh, uh, describe. But I like to keep it simple in saying that the habit formations, basically it's all the habits of thinking and doing uh, and opinions and greed and hatred and uh, all of our intentions to move the body and to uh, do just about anything is a volitional formation. But basically they're habits. Because the baby didn't have too many of them when it was first born, but it started getting them as soon as he started crawling and grabbing for this and grabbing for that. And, and then, uh, you know, experiencing more and more uh, pain and, and pleasure, developing greed and, and then wanting more of it. And, and then, uh, uh, you know, developing fear and worry and anxiety that uh, triggers off so many people's uh, activities like you know, taking the drink, taking the drugs, taking the, any kind of vice or harmful activities. So those are all the volitional formations. And that's really the fuel for rebirth. So anytime you do a karmic action, a volitional activities mostly are the result of karma. Karma means intentional action. So you have an idea to do something and you do it. Uh, including like breaking the precepts or even practicing meditation. I mean, there's good volitional formations too. Uh, but so these volitional formations, if they're still strong in the mind at the time of death, then that is like the fuel that propels the consciousness to seek out another uh, existence. Because we go on keep keep putting fuel in the sankaras every time we deliberately do things, every time you scratch an itch, or you, you, know, you do any, anything, you know, move, move, move from a pain. And it strengthens those habits. Every time you do something volition, uh, it strengthens the habit. So anyway, those are what produce, keep the consciousness going. Uh, <clears throat> to create the mind and the body and to be born into this world. But specifically, I want to talk about the karmic creating process, which is the, the middle two, uh, the middle the three or four uh, steps of the 12 makers. Am I losing anybody? Okay. Uh, so anyway, the volitional formations are what produce consciousness, keep consciousness uh, uh, alive, or ego consciousness. And then when we're born, that, that mind uh, you know, gets this uh, body with its senses, and then we have contact with the world. The baby comes out of the womb. For nine months, the baby's in this nice, cozy, little, warm, uh, you know, womb, right? But then when it comes out, you know, bright lights, and all kinds of sounds, you know, it gets whacked on the rump and it starts experiencing, you know, pain. That's contact. All kinds of sounds are coming through the ears, but he doesn't really know any what in any meaning. He's seeing all these things, he doesn't know what it is, uh, and so on. But anyway, contact. That's the sensory contacts. That's what uh, makes consciousness arise. Now, if you're sleeping, let's say you're sleeping at night, and you're sound asleep, and you don't hear anything that's going on in your room, and maybe you're, you're not even dreaming, or you, know, you may be dreaming, or, you know, sometimes you don't have to you have a sound of sleep. But then all of a sudden there's a huge bang, you know, maybe a tree fall on your house or a sonic boom or just anything, you know. And it penetrates that slumber. So the mind is kind of drowsy or sleeping. And if that uh, sound is strong enough, it penetrates and awakens the consciousness. Oh, 
So <clears throat> that's the meaning of the contact. It, it awakens the mind, the mind becomes alert. And then yeah. it, that contact produces a feeling. The feeling might be a painful feeling or a pleasant feeling or a neutral feeling. Well, let's stick with the uh, pleasant and painful ones for the moment because those are the ones that cause us to do most of our, get caught up in the current with greed and uh, aversion and so on. Are you still with me? <clears throat> so then that feeling produces craving. That means a desire to get that pleasurable feeling or the desire to get away from the pleasurable feeling. That's the initial kind of uh, reaction. And then you, having cognized what the object is and uh, being attracted to it or averse to it, then you start thinking, how am I going to get this object? How am I going to satisfy that craving? How am I going to get away from this painful thing? And that takes a little bit more time. That takes some thinking. You have to plan and scheme. How am I going to steal it? How am I going to tell a lie? Or whatever. How am I going to move that the teacher doesn't see me moving in meditation? I'll think it. So it, it, it's a lot of thinking. So grasping is a very large, uh, uh, takes up a, more time than the other ones. Uh, and then you've got to make a decision, right? I mean, how many of you thought to do a things and you kind of went back and forth, wavering, should I, shouldn't I? But then at some point, you had to make a final decision, right? You're either going to do it or you're not going to do it. So that decision, the conscious decision, like you were thinking for a while, you know, should I tell a lie or not? Okay, and then you either, you don't do it or you do it. Uh, or to use bad speech or something. So that's the karma right there, the conscious intention. And that's called becoming. It's a very interesting word, becoming, or bhava. Now, some translators translate it as being. And I'll try to make that distinction in a, in a moment. But anyway, so the bhava is, uh, I like to use the term becoming. Being is also there, but becoming is more of, it means you're strengthening the habit. So whenever you gave in to the desire, you strengthen the habit. Whenever you restrain the desire, you weaken the habit. Like every time, let's say, if you have an itch on your head, how many people have gone through this already with itches or painful feelings? And you're, you know, Papi said, don't scratch me. He's crazy. I want to scratch me. I'm not a bear dog. <laughs> you might go back and forth, you know, many times. <laughs> uh, but then he said, no, I won't. And you just sit through it, but he said, endure that. And so you do it, and you said, oh, wow. Oh, I did that. You know, it, it went away after, you know, 10 or 15 more seconds. And then you feel good about yourself. So you weaken that sankara. All these becomings go back into the sankara pot at the beginning. So you weaken that habit. So that the next time it might be easier not to you know go back and forth so much in your mind about it. And if you can do that long enough and long enough, then that's the way you're able to develop the ability to sit through pains without so much struggling or any other kinds of distraction, basically. That same scenario can be applied to virtually even thoughts in your mind. You know, maybe you got confusion in your mind and thinking about, well, oh, you got to get aside to you know, go, go on this vacation or that vacation or this restaurant, that restaurant in your mind and, uh, and so on. But anyway, so every time you, you give in, you strengthen the habit. So it'll, it'll come more automatically. And every time you resist that, uh, that reaction, 
than you weaken the habit. And that's probably one of the most important factors. The whole Dhamma is really there in that becoming. But all these to get, and then there's the next one is birth. So I've already mentioned that you, you're strengthening the habit, right? So when the same thing happens five minutes later, it'll be born again. That means you'll go through the whole process and the, and the sense of self is strengthened. Because every time you get the object of your desire, then there's a feeling of, ah, oh, I got it, I got it. You know? And every time you, you get the painful or you struggle to get away from pain, you, you think, oh, I, I conquered that person. And we defeated somebody in a debate or uh, argument or something else. Anyway, all these actions strengthen the sense of self. And that is birth. That means the sense of self is going to come up the next time even stronger. But every time you deny the self, and you, you don't give in to reacting uh, to uh, grasp the pleasure or to get away from the pain, then you are sort of weakening the sense of self. So <clears throat> those four stages, contact, feeling, grasping, becoming, and birth, those five stages, are really the process that are that's that's the life process. That's 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 where your life revolves. Because without contact, you're basically just dead. You know, sleeping. You sleep for six or eight hours a night. Basically, you're you're dead to the world, right? I mean, your heart is beating, and so on, and you wake up. But and then when you're dead and die physically, then you know you leave this world. So the that, that's really the living process. And that's what motivates our life. So, <clears throat> and the whole practice of Dhamma is oriented toward becoming aware of that. Living with awareness means understanding this process and seeing the implications of it, that it's keeping you caught and trapped in this web, a uh, karmic web, right? You know, it's a, it's a sticky web. Right? The inner tangle and the outer tangle. Did I mention that the other day? Yes? No? Yes. Somebody came to the Buddha and said, oh, the inner tangle and the outer. Okay, I did already say. So when when we're sitting and meditating. This is the application. This is what awareness, mindfulness, vipassana, whatever you want to call it. This is the focus of the meditation is these five stages, or at least, or at least a few of them. So you're sitting there and you're having contacts. You're feeling different body sensations. You're feeling the clothing rubbing on the skin. That's the contact. You're feeling the, the breath going in and out. Whether the air touching the nostrils, that's a contact. Or you, the skin uh, rubbing against the skin, that's a contact. <clears throat> or anything else. The glasses on, on your head, the hair on your head. The sounds coming through. Or maybe any any smells, but normally in the meditation hall and during seated meditation, most of the contacts are limited to the the physical body and sounds and uh, thoughts. Sometimes there may not be too many sounds, but there's always body sensations because there's billions of cells and they're all vibrating and they're all producing sensations. But normally our mind is focus outside or asleep, so it's not even feeling them. But once you get centered in the body, then boom, you can, you know, have a, a good awareness of so many uh, sensations, and that's what keeps the mind alert and awake. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, and, and those contacts are producing feeling. 
And how many of you in your meditation could notice a, a painful feeling? Did anybody notice a pleasant feeling? Yeah, yeah some pleasant feelings too. Like even the, you know, the light touch and just the, you know, the shirt sleeve touching the hair or the arm, it was kind of a pleasant feeling. It was just, you know, it's, it's not painful. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, ting uh, uh, tingling sensations in your hand. You, know, you did some yoga, you feel, how many people felt some kind of rushes of energy while doing yoga or some, you know, kind of sensation? Was that pleasant? Some of it? Apart from the pains that you might have had, especially when that prana is flowing, and you feel the life force in your hands and fingers, that's a pleasant feeling. So anyway, so these are the pleasant feelings. And then that produces desire, or if it's painful, aversion. You want to get rid of that itch, you want to move from the pain, or you want to... Uh, Try to get the deeper samadhi to get more piti and sukha. <clears throat> so in the whole world, all of our every action that we take in our life basically is uh, following the pleasant feeling and trying to avoid uh, the painful feeling. So if we don't have pleasant feelings, we seek them out. What restaurant can I go to? Today? Whatever you know, go window shopping to satisfy the, the, the newest thing. Uh, and so we're always uh, and then once you get the object of the desire, then. Uh, you know, it doesn't last very really long because of impermanence. Uh, or how many people have bought new things at Home Depot or Walmart or other places? They thought they really needed it. And then they took it home. And they used it maybe once or maybe not at all. They put it on the kitchen table and forgot about it. But how much scheming and planning went into, you know, thinking that you had to have that object, maybe in a quarrel with your spouse. Oh, you shouldn't buy that. We don't have, can't afford that. Yes, yes, I need those new shoes. I need that new shirt. <laughs> I need a new gadget for the garage. People get in arguments over this. <laughs> they might even come to fisticuffs. We've seen it. Over what? You know, when, when you look at it, like, nobody ever explains it this way, you know, they, they're so caught up in their, but when you look at it, it's, it's so silly. You know, that so much suffering is caused by it. Anyway, or you, once you get the object, then you have to protect it. You know, then you're holding onto the object. And in the same way, once you've gotten a, a rid of a pain, then there's the, the, the worry of it going to be coming back again. And again, that's that's what I meant by the pleasure pain syndrome. <clears throat> so that's where these feelings uh, play, you know, the most, the most important driver of our life, but it's the becoming in which you're you're then uh, solidifying that by taking action on the on the field. So uh, craving is the initial desire that pops in your mind. Let's say, you know, you're meditating and, you know, your mouth is dry or, or maybe there's some, uh, you know, and, and you have a desire, I'm going to take a drink of water. Or on a hot day at home and, you know, you, you know uh, I'd like to get an ice cream. But so it's just a, the initial thought. It's not very powerful by itself. Maybe you're not in the right place, or you know you're meditating, and you know a bunch will see me if I take a drink of water. Better not, you know. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so you, uh, you know, you try to let go of that uh, uh, that that action. Uh, 
But if you're not in a position, so the initial craving or aversion is not really that strong, but it's only when you grasp it, you say, yes, I have to have that at all costs. I have to scratch that itch. It's going to kill me if I don't. And so the grasping is the continued, is the amplified craving. So craving itself, initial craving is not a big deal. It's the grasping. And that's all of our thoughts, planning, scheming, conniving <clears throat> that go on uh, in order to, you know, and then it comes to the decision then to do it. So the grasping again, as I already mentioned, it's a sort of a longer phase. And you can see that in your mind each time these things come up, you know, you identify this is next. And then if you take an action on it or not, uh, becoming, that means you strengthen that idea that this object, you know, you have to have it for your life. You can't be happy without this object, where it solidifies uh, uh, the idea of, you know, this is a, a painful thing and it's going to kill me if I don't get rid of it. I mean, this is all you know, going on in your, in your unconscious, pretty much a lot of it in your conscious. But that's the way most of our life happens on the unconscious level, actually. But <clears throat> so that is that uh, process. So don't worry too much about craving. You know, a lot of people, second noble truth, what does it say? Craving is the cause of suffering. Does it? You ever heard that? What's the cause of craving? Thirst. <laughs> Thirst is craving. What's the cause of craving? Come on. Ignorance. I heard it. Ah, uh, yes. Ignorance. Ignorance is basically the addiction to me, I. And, uh, and not knowing the truth about karma and not knowing the truth about the life and the mind, all of that kind of <laughs> together uh, causes, uh, you know, the craving and desire. But even more so, it's the disconnection from the body. That happened the moment the baby got its first pleasant feeling of chocolate. Or it had its first painful feeling of uh, the cat scratching. And that started the whole process of wanting pleasurable feelings and to avoid uh, painful feelings. Uh, and then the mind going outside, searching out for pleasurable feelings going out of your way to avoid the and be a painful feelings. So it's a disconnection from the present moment. In the beginning, they, they get lost into the uh, past and the future. And the tug of war between pleasure and pain is because of that disconnection from the present moment in, uh, in the body. So, again, don't worry too much about craving. A lot of people hear about, oh, you have to give up all desires. You know, people first learn Buddha. What do the Buddha teach? Some, some person who doesn't know anybody would say, you have to get rid of all desire. And hear that, oh my, my God, are you crazy? How can I do that? So don't think you have to get rid of all desire. You gotta manage the desire. And there's certain desires that are okay that they're not gonna harm ourselves or harm others or uh, kill our body. You know, innocent sort of desires, like attaining the first or second jhana and experiencing piti and sukha. The Buddha said that's an innocent desire. That's a good one. Uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the that uh, you have to understand desire. And 
And again, the, the desire is simply that initial, you know, attraction to an object. Uh, but if you have mindfulness and you can just be aware that uh, wanting, 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 you notice a wanting in the mind, like you want to move, you want to you know, look. You know, to, to notice that wanting is really that that one of the deepest levels of awareness, because that that wanting comes from you know deep in the nervous system. And so when you're in developing mindfulness, if you can, you know, the moment that you see that that kind of urge or wanting, you have your mindfulness there. And if you can hold it there without reacting, the and you don't produce grasping, so the initial desire is there. But if you don't turn it into grasping, the desire will vanish because it needs grasping to continue. That's the vital connection. Uh, <clears throat> And then, so that's why in mindfulness, and you know, feelings are already, you can't prevent feelings from arising. They're gonna arise because the result of past karma and the habits. But you can observe the feeling and then observe the urge to either get the feeling or get away from the feeling, which is the craving. So craving is the, really the, only, the first thing that you can actually uh, notice coming up clearly. Uh, and then usually you can't do too much about the craving. The craving is going to be there, but what you have to focus is on the grasping. So that's that link between craving and grasping. There's That's where meditation is. That's where you cut off the thoughts, you cut off the uh, reaction that you might be making. Uh, so don't worry about craving too much. But you observe it, but then you try to uh, prevent the, the grasping that then leads to the, the becoming. Uh, and once you've done the action, you can't take it back. It's etched into the nervous system and into the unconscious mind, and it will keep coming up, you know, again and again. So, uh, so that, that whole process is called the karma process. Uh, and in the becoming is the actual karma. And so that's why, uh, you know, in, in Buddhist practice, all the things like the, the precepts, observing uh, the, the five precepts as a lay person or uh, you know, monastic precepts, uh, they're all, they're about preventing uh, becoming. Now there's, uh, there's sila, samadhi, and panya. That's all, sila, samadhi, and panya are intimately connected to craving, grasping, and becoming. Am I losing anybody now? Sila, samadhi, panya? How many people have heard that? That means uh, observing precepts or, you know, uh, skillful behavior, skillful conduct. And then concentration, mindfulness and concentration. And then the wisdom that comes out of the mindfulness and concentration or the concentrated mindfulness, uh, awareness. So the, the becoming basically is connected with sila to, to weaken becoming is directly connected to sila. Because most of our becoming, the negative becoming, is breaking the precept. And then we worry, have worry, fear, agitation, guilt, worry, remorse, and having hurt others, abused others, and used wrong speech, uh, and, you know, the, all those uh, the, the right action, right livelihood, and right speech of the Eightfold Path, and maybe we'll come to later, but uh, those are connected with the uh, sila, the skillful behavior, the law of karma. That's where the law of karma in our in our active life is, is focused around 
the, the speech, the actions, and uh, in our in our thoughts, especially the the speech and the actions, because that's where we uh, get entangled with others and and so on. So this the sila, you know, you take the precept. So sila is like putting a fence around your life, you know, not to kill you. Don't go there. Like Bhante was talking you know, the first night in the lunch. But it's such a common habit, you know, especially with insects and ants in your house or cockroaches in your in the sink and so on. But uh, anyway, but it, it also means abusing others and so on. So anyway, <clears throat> so the sila helps to reduce the becoming, the, the heavy becoming of you know, the painful consequences of our those karmic actions. You know, again, the, the precepts are killing or abusing others, you know, stealing, lying, slandering, uh, intoxicating the mind. Most of our negative actions come from the intoxicated mind. That's why refraining from intoxicants is considered uh, one of the important uh, five precepts. Because the average person wouldn't kill and tell lies and rape, pillage, and plunder if they were uh, sober. <laughs> because people get intoxicated, right? They drink or drugs and they lose their common sense and they go do so many foolish things that uh, hurt others. You get in your car, driving, and kill somebody. You're drunk. So that's why these, uh, the, the, the precepts help to uh, reduce or curb the problems coming from those that kind of become. But then you have the samadhi. So the sila, samadhi, and panya. So sila helps to reduce becoming. But then you still have thoughts in your mind. Like mosquito lands on you. And you see that urge to want to get rid of it. And initially, if you weren't a, a, a Buddhist, you, you might just get out and think about this little slap. Or you see a, you know, an earwig in your sink at home, you know, flush it down, you know, uh, ants, you know, put poison on them. You know, people do that even without thinking you know, a lot. You know. uh, but <clears throat> so the The precept, uh, so you might want to do it, but the thoughts are still there. Because, so that's why practicing sila is not enough. Because you forcibly restrain yourself from telling that lie or you know, stealing something or uh, whatever. But the the desire to do it may still be in your mind. So that's where the samadhi plays its important part. How many of you reached some level of concentration the last couple of days, or maybe it was even in previous retreats or at home or whatever? You reached a state of meditation where maybe a fly was crawling on your head, but you didn't do anything about it. And why didn't you do anything about it? Because the mind was calm and relaxed and it was tuning into some pleasurable feeling. So the, the pain or the irritation of uh, what maybe what that was uh, didn't, you know, kind of trigger something. That's due to the samadhi. And as mentioned when I was in Sri Lanka as a young monk sitting out with mosquitoes, so I endured all that because I got into a, you know, a deep state of concentration and awareness and sitting out met and all that. So it didn't really bother me. Uh, I mean, there were sensations there, but you know, it was there's a like a disconnect. So the samadhi is important for reducing the grasping. So grasping are the thoughts connected with doing something. But when you meditate, your thoughts subside or stop, right? Did not totally stop, but anyway, they reduce their momentum and become more quiet. 
So even thinking about breaking the precept wouldn't arise in your mind. So that is how the samadhi affects grasping. The sila affects becoming. Samadhi works on the grasping. Now what's left? Panya affects what? No. Craving. We're talking about craving, grasping, becoming, becoming, grasping, craving. I learned how to do it front and backwards. Uh, and sila samadhi panya. So it's ignorance. Ignorance and, and uh, but craving more importantly but ignorance too. So, because if you're familiar with the, uh, how many people have heard about the 10 stages of uh, and the four paths and fruits of the, of the higher meditation, reaching the stage of the once, never uh, entering the stream, once returning, never returning, and the arahat stage. How many have heard of that? Now, how many have heard of the 10 fetters? The 10 fetters are directly connected to those four stages. Only a couple people have heard the 10 fetters. So each of those four stages are certain fetters, it means mental defilements that prevent you from reaching that stage. So the stream enter, uh, you know, destroys three of those fetters. I'm not gonna explain them right now because it takes too long, but. And then the second stage reduces greed and hatred. So a stream entry doesn't necessarily reduce greed and hatred too much. But only at the second stage, the once return, they just weaken it, maybe let's say 90%. But you still might have dreams of sensual desire or stabbing somebody or something. But that, you, know, you wouldn't have that in your consciousness too much. Um, but maybe they exist in the latent unconscious uh, things. But anyway, so uh, greed and hatred, which is craving, because craving means you're craving to want something, you're craving to get away from something. Aversion is simply negative craving. That's why when you say craving, it means both desire and aversion. It's just negative Craving. You want to, you're craving to get away from something. So uh, that's reduced uh, in that by um, that's why you can't you can't try to get rid of craving. You're always going to get eliminated by reaching wisdom by by attaining those path of fruits. Uh, I mean, you can weaken it to some extent, but uh, the the deep underlying unconscious tendencies are still there. So uh, that's where the, the, the Vipassana meditation and developing insight meditation and working towards eventually uh, maybe, you know, becoming, uh, entering the stream, which means the mind is, is you know, had a, a glimpse of, of the truth and the bana and it, it uh, you know, it, it changes your life to some extent. And you, you, you can never forget it. Uh, so anyway, so the wisdom that uh, you know, penetrates in, and goes into the unconscious mind and weakens those fetters or destroys those fetters. But it only can happen when you attain the, that deep state of, of insight. That's why the, just practicing samadhi by itself concentrating and just wanting to attain the first or second jhana just to experience piti and sukha and white light in your mind or something like that. Uh, and then you come out, but you don't go on to develop wisdom. You come out and just you know, you feel very relaxed and calm. Uh, some, some people practice it, but uh, you know, they don't go on to develop what is called penetrating insight. Which is a, a mind. It's like a, a camera lens opening and closing like that. But let's say you were in a dark room and you didn't know what was in the room. 
Now all of a sudden there's a, a lightning bolt, a flash, but it only lasted like one second. But in that one second, you saw, wow, this, this room is full of stuff. I've been really careful. You walk over that way, you bump into one you know, table and you turn around and bump into something else. There's, you know, but with that one flash, you know, now you realize this room is full of all kinds of stuff. I'd be better be careful where I walk. Maybe there's a bear trap on the floor. <laughs> so, uh, so you'd be more careful. You can't see again. The bolt went away, but now you you know. Before you didn't know that the room was full of dangers. Now you know it's full of dangers. So now you're just more careful. You put your hands out in front of you instead of just running and tripping and falling down and banging your shins or your forehead. You know, so the mindfulness is like having your, <laughs> your hands out in front of you uh, to be careful when you're you know, going about. So that's how that, uh, that, uh, that the, the insights uh, work uh, in weakening the the craving and the desire. So anyway, I just wanted to uh, kind of, you know, put that out there and kind of show you this connection. Because these are things that you should think about. I mean, you know, in the Eightfold Path, right understanding and right thought, those are the first two steps of the Eightfold Path. And it means thinking about the dumb. Right understanding means understanding that teachings of the Dhamma, the Buddha, especially in this, in this uh, context, uh, and uh, right thought. Because you can have right understanding, but if you don't go on thinking about it, you quickly forget about what you read. How many people read a book sometimes? And they close it down and one hour later, I forgot, right? Because you didn't think about it. Uh, so the right thought is important, and you have to go on thinking, and uh, which includes like when you meditate, you can think about the, uh, you know, the Dhamma while you're meditating. That's called Chintamaya Pandya. Uh, and we're thinking about karma, thinking about the five aggregates, thinking about greed, hatred, and delusion. But anyway, so uh, those two are the, uh, you know, the important because if you're right if your views are wrong your view about the world and your view about life and your view about the mind if your understanding is wrong your thoughts will be wrong if your thoughts are wrong your speech will be wrong if your speech is wrong your actions will be wrong if your actions are wrong your livelihood will be wrong and if all those previous things are wrong, your mindfulness will be wrong, your concentration will be wrong, and you won't have any wisdom, or your wisdom will be wrong. It will be uh, erroneous uh, uh, views about things. So that's you know the importance of developing right understanding and, and right thought, because it helps to make everything else Now, when we use the term right and wrong, I mean, a lot of people these days is woke culture, I guess, you know, I think right and wrong, we shouldn't use this word, right? Really. Appropriate, inappropriate, right and wrong. <laughs> okay, so when we say right in the Dhamma, it means whatever is right means it leads to more happiness, well-being, calmness of mind. And whatever is wrong leads to more guilt, worry, remorse, and fear and other uh, pro karmic problems. So when we use those terms, right and wrong, you know, in your speech, that's who, it's not some moral kind of thing, but it's uh, according to the, about happiness, certain things bring happiness, and calmness of mind and ha more happiness, and other things bring more confusion, more problems, more entanglement. So what, what is right uh, disentangles the tangle, and what is wrong tightens that tangle of the, of the inner and outer tangle, what we're talking about. Right? Okay. okay, friends.
I think uh, might have gone on long enough. And uh, did somebody have a question particularly about? Yeah, just interesting. So what does the, how does the bee include a new people that are really mentally unwell, that aren't capable of having a cognitive understanding that you're just having? Because of ignorance accumulated from the past life or even the conditioning from when they were a baby, if you were born into a family that was sort of a very dysfunctional family and, you know, it was all chaotic and you know, full of wrong views and this and that and whatever, then the baby's going <laughs> to get problems like that or, you know, crack baby and stuff like that. And so many things that are... Uh, Causing people to be crazy, but uh, I should use that word. Oh, everybody's crazy, but <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm too old. Uh, so, the, but a, a lot of that has come from the sun carols, even from the past life. If we would have uh, done stuff like that to others in the past life, or done stuff that that could uh, cause people to be born with these kind of uh, disabilities, you know. Okay, anyway, uh, write those down for the. How do you get out of it? How do you get out of it? Yeah, those people. Well, it, it may be too late. Some diseases and disabilities uh, make it difficult to study Dhamma. But the parents, by and large, have to set the example. Because a child is raised by the parents for the first, you know, 15, 20 years, usually, right? Uh, and so the parents have to set the example. The problem is, there's a lot of parents that maybe not, not setting good examples because they themselves haven't been trained in, in good examples. So this is all, you know, this is how, you know, evolution goes and, and things spread around the world because of. Uh, you know, wrong views. It's come from wrong views and not having Dhamma as one's uh, guidance. On that topic, can you point to those of us who love people who are in that situation, someone who's lost in moral thought or lost in depression or lost in mental illness? How do we take care of ourselves? When we see them suffering and our our grief arises so powerful, um, that's I'm literally where I am. I am living in grief with uh, a number of people in my family who are destroying themselves, and uh, um, I can't do anything. No, it's a very big problem these days, and especially uh, caregivers. You know, they they themselves are going to have to have a caregiver. <laughs> uh, and well. Understanding law of karma, as I mentioned yesterday. You give birth to a child, but you don't own that child. That child came to you, so to speak. You didn't go out there and choose, hey, there's a dog eating rebirth, ah, come to me. Or some uh, some neighbor down the street's dying, oh, no, come, come to me in the next birth. No, you're not doing that. But that's the mystery of about the karma and rebirth. But so uh, this, the mind that leaves the body is magnetized with certain types of thoughts and habits and so on. So it'll be attracted to an environment where it will be able to get those kind of things. Uh, and the Buddha has given you know, a couple of super, very powerful suttas, the Kama Vibhanga suttas in which he talks about the common. The people that uh, kill, cheat, rape, steal, lie, pillage, and plunder, they're going to suffer in the next life. They're making fun of people that are, uh, you know, maimed and disabled, and like certain politicians have done, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> they might be, be okay in this life, but they're going to get it in the next life or some subsequent life. Anyway, that's just the... Uh, the thinking behind it. But, uh, so, equanimity. As I mentioned this yesterday, you do whatever you can do. 
and say there's a substance abuser in your family. And they, they don't want to cheat. They don't want to go to therapy. They bend over backwards to help you. Or they go to therapy and they escape after a week. You know, and you know, that may happen many times. And you're, going, you're driving yourself crazy. You're blaming yourself. What did I do? When I was, I wasn't a good mother. No, no. You gotta stop. Well, sure, maybe people do, we're not perfect, right? You know, maybe some people are not perfect parents. But still, that child, if they have the, the past karma that's going to cause them to become a criminal or something else, uh, then, I mean, not only that, but, uh, you know, then according to the, like the environment that they're brought up in, all these things are going to uh, have an effect. But anyway, you try to have compassion to help these people, but at a certain point, if it's going to make you sick, and you have to, uh, that's where the equanimity comes in. You see, this person has to work out their own karma. Now, if a person is like, you know, from birth, or they, you know, like, a, I don't want to mention diseases because then you'll blame me for uh, you know, using the wrong speech, but, you know, I guess you know what I mean, right? Uh, like, you have to care for this person the whole life. Okay, they, they may not, dumb is not going to help them. We know that from a medical standpoint. There's some medical conditions. The Dhamma is not going to help. They're not going to change. And so you brought them into the world, then, okay, you need to care for them. But other people who have a mind and they decide for themselves that they're going to you know, become a drug addict and they don't want help and this and that, at some point, uh, you have to let go of it. And it may sound uh, cruel, but if you destroy yourself, you're not going to be helping help anybody. Okay. Okay, friends, I think we'll stop there so we can... Uh, actually, the interviews are going to be starting uh, pretty soon. So now let me just explain. So uh, until the yoga session at five, it was a little bit less than uh, two hours, I'm going, this is going to be kind of like an open session, but first of all, I want you all to, you know, stand up and practice the standing. And then, you know, people are at different stages, right? So some people might want to sit longer, maybe they're working on enduring pain. And that's one thing I wanted to mention, the ability to endure pain. If, you know, like a lot of people say, don't do that, that's bad for you. Well, that's not all the pain. But enduring the pains of just sitting for an hour or two, and none of those are going to cure you. But, uh, you know, to endure that, at some point, even if you can grit your teeth and you know, not to move, you can break through. It's called breaking through, which means breaking the pain barrier. And the, the mind can kind of just break through into a feeling that of very lightness, and the pain will have disappeared, and the body will feel very light, that may last only for a short period of time. But, uh, you know, there are, you know, we're, that is an experience that can, can be done. But, uh, you know, I'm not advocating you do that necessarily, but as I mentioned, just learning how to endure, because most of those pains that come up in sitting are not going to kill you in one hour or, or so, or one and a half hours. And so some people, you know, want to do that and do which uh, develop that at <clears> all. <throat> so uh, it'll be kind of open. So people can sit longer if they want, or you uh, you can do walking or standing, like we did this morning, pretty much that last hour of this morning, right? Okay. Are you okay with that? Okay. Uh, all right. So then just continue that until you probably hear a gong, maybe in about 10 minutes before five. Or or a quarter to five, and you can, uh, you know, go in and get ready for uh, a yoga session that will be led by Anne again. Sadhu, 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 Thank you. 
But you'll have to time yourself, you know, people that have the interviews that say, if you have a second or third interviews, then you could go out and do walking in the dining hall, you know, if you know your interview is coming up, you know, in two or three persons, you can go in and do walking so that you'll, you'll see the person coming out and then you can, actually it's in the library. But we're going to have- Where's the sign? I think that was in the kitchen. It's near the little question box in the Sangha hall. So there were still some open spaces there. And just try to remember some of the things that I've been mentioning, you know, the, the tips on, you know, 